Welcome back, kids. I have with me today Dr. Tracy Ann Paulson. How are you doing today? Hi, Tracy. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Well. It's been a minute. It has been. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, PhD in uh, licensed clinical social work. Yes. Psychotherapy. Yes. Uh, you work with uh, uh, marital counseling, premarital counseling, LGBTQ. Uh, uh, so tell us, we were talking before, uh, the pandemic response that has either uh, escalated uh, people's preconditioning, you know, uh, uh, pre-existing conditions uh, of anxiety disorders or, you know, PTSD, the like, depression, uh, but also new onset from from this quarantine, you know, pandemic response. Have you seen uh, an upward tick in the tr a trend going upward in the number of cases of people that are exhibiting those symptoms? Absolutely. Um, I've received more calls than I can remember in my mm -hmm. practice. I don't advertise. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that are both here in Jacksonville, but all over the country. Mm -hmm. Everybody is saying the same thing, that they're, seeing, they're getting more calls, emails, people reaching out, people really struggling right now. And I, right. as I mentioned to you before, I've also seen a tremendous amount of increase in suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. um, people who are really feeling overwhelmed, they don't know how to cope. Um, so it's not just, you know, to your point, what people have already been struggling with, mm -hmm. but then the pandemic has just layered on yeah. another um, really frightening um, and threatening right, right. situation, right? Like because this virus, um, in fact, I have a cousin right now who's who's on life support um, mm -hmm. in the hospital mm -hmm. in Sorry Virginia. So it's impacted all of us mm -hmm. in various ways, and some you know people have lost their lives, and so just the threat of that has really increased people's anxiety. Right, um, right. It's, yeah, it's, it's quite marked. Mm. Uh, lost their lives, but and the ones that have survived uh, lost their livelihood, a lot of them. Uh, loss of money, loss of job. Uh, uh, families have, you know, been stressed to the breaking point. Yeah. You know, uh, couples are breaking up, moving out. Uh, it, it's just affecting people on so many different levels. Yeah. I've seen that. I don't. I, you might have heard too that there's been a significant increase in the number of domestic violence incidents, I can calls imagine. to DCF, um, parents at their wits' end, um, and lashing out at their children. So we're seeing it in all the relational ways mm -hmm. as people have been quarantined and sort of um, in, in sort of a more of a, a contained environment, mm. and that just adds pressure to again yeah. things that were already happening. It's yeah. it's. It's disturbing. Yeah, you might have a uh, a, uh, a dual income family, for instance, and quite possibly both of them lost a job. Yeah. Uh, so that that's quite an impact. Well, we they? know that nationally, right? Like unemployment mm. rates are high. Oh, we yeah. know that in Florida, and then of course there was, you know, all the problems with the unemployment system here. So oh, yeah. it's it's taxing people in a lot of different ways. Um, but losing your livelihood in the middle of of this life-threatening pandemic. I mean, you can understand why people are so um, stressed out and are thinking about, you know, how do I get out of this and really at their wit's end. But I will say this, that, you know, there's help. Mm -hmm. um, not enough of it, especially here in Jacksonville and in Florida. Mm -hmm. We need more mental health providers. We need a continuum of, of mental health care. Um, a system of care to provide services for people. And you're going to just see this, I think, grow and grow. as mm -hmm. Even as the pandemic sort of wanes, I think you're still going to see a, an increase for services. And do you see uh, uh, that, uh, by and large, a lot of people are reluctant to seek therapy? I think it depends on... Um, I think it depends, right? Like some people, um, and I always say this when, when somebody calls me and comes to see me, I say, you know, I have tremendous um, appreciation and what it, the bravery that it takes to call a total stranger sure, to sure, reach out sure. and come and see somebody that you don't know and tell your most private secrets. Sure. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, like help, help is out there. I think there's a lot happening in this community to destigmatize stigmatize mental health for people mm -hmm. getting help. I know I certainly, I mean, I have a wonderful therapist. I still, um, you know, talk to her once a week. I feel like that's really important in terms of the work that I sure, do, sure. but also in terms of my own history, I've been, you know, very vocal about that. Um, so I think the more that people can sort of talk about how incredibly powerful and life-saving it can be 
to talk to somebody who really understands and to ha can help you think through mm -hmm. what you're what you're going through, what you're feeling, and at least in my practice, to be able to explore options for ways of coping with things. Right, right. In in uh, in many cases, do you think it's uh, the therapy helps people to rationalize what they may have been irrational about in the past, or maybe? What do you? I mean, would you have a particular <laughs> idea? Uh, uh, well, the stigma behind, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, big strapping young man, you know, that that just feels like therapy would be a weak a weakness, you know, and it's really an irrational thought. Uh, but going in for that first therapy session and and realizing that, you know, maybe he'd been wrong all those years. Well, never forget, and I never forget <clears throat> that I represent authority and mm -hmm. a lot of people have this mix or this um, idea that I can read their minds or that I know things or that I'm judging or diagnosing mm -hmm. so I'm always mindful of that um, that people are on some level they're afraid to be seen they're afraid mm -hmm. to be known even at the same time they deeply want to be known mm -hmm. um, so I just am very mindful that a lot of people have feelings of <clears throat> fear and confusion around mm -hmm. Am I going to judge them? I'm, am I going to diagnose them? Will I really understand and try to get them? Right. Um, and so I really try to use, you know, my training, but also just the person that I am mm -hmm. to try to communicate that the purpose is really to try to help them understand themselves, know themselves better, because the better we know ourselves, the more we are less vulnerable to other people to um, sort of control or manipulate us, right, the, more, right. the, the better we are able to sort of see and understand our own options and relationships mm -hmm. in our communities. Like, I, I really think about it in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in another area of our population, the LTGB uh, uh, community, uh, um, do you uh, already living in a stigmatized, you know, uh, life, uh, being more accepted in some cities than others, and, and Jacksonville being kind of a hard nut to crack when, when, as far as that goes. Now, there are pockets, there are neighborhoods where they feel more comfortable living. Uh, do you think that uh, 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 this pandemic has compounded on top of that, or they're just dealing with it like the rest of us are? Well, I mean, I just... And I say the rest of us, meaning, you know, straight. Yeah, I mean... Um, my experience in terms of um, both friends that I have who identify as LGBTQ, mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the people that I see in my practice, I've heard that they feel a little less um, sort of threatened and stigmatized with the change in the presidency um, mm -hmm. in November. Well. I mean, I've had friends tell me, like, I feel like I can go out. I'm not, I don't feel quite as um, worried, you know, about mm -hmm. my safety. I think that's a good thing. Um, I also know that it has really sort of illustrated that there are lots of people who still have um, a sort of prejudice sure, and sure. not not really understanding. I can think of a few. Yeah, <laughs> not really understanding. Um, you know, uh, people who identify as not being, you know, heterosexual. Mm -hmm. And their needs are just like most of ours, Absolutely. right? Like, which is sort of to be safe and to be valued and respected right. and to want to make a contribution mm -hmm. um, to their families, their community. And I feel like the more inclusive and open we can be, the better we're able to sort of, you know, um, get really good talent and mm -hmm. ideas and innovation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was uh, talking with the producer earlier this morning, and uh, we uh, had mentioned my, my sister is on her way back from Maryland. Uh, she had gone up there, was up there for about 10 days. Uh, she had gone to visit her girlfriend, and they're, they're going to be getting married in the fall, and this will be my sister's second marriage, but uh, they're going to be married in the fall up in Maryland, so i got to figure a way to get up there for the wedding. And my uncle, uh, he lives, he's been living with his partner for about 30 years, and uh, they live up in New Hampshire. They're going to come down to the wedding and everything, and I haven't seen him in probably 30 years, my dad's brother. Uh, so, so it, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a really good wedding, and it's going to be a good uh, reunion for my uncle and I, and it's it's going to be really nice, and it's a beautiful area up yeah. there. She's like 
couple of blocks from the Potomac River. Okay, so I spent yeah. many years in Maryland. Beautiful um, up there. Prior to moving here. <laughs> Depends um, on the weather. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, no, that's lovely. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, um, yeah. It she is, was extremely happy. Yes, and it is different, right? Like, politically mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, the, the sort of um, mindset in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. When, back in the early 80s, um, I, my ex-husband and I belonged to a United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and that was really where I sort of began undoing my own sort of internalized homophobia that sort of grew out of, um, you know, my early years in terms of the Southern Baptist Church. Oh, yeah. And a lot of it was just my own ignorance and not really knowing and thinking that in fact, you know, the Bible talks about it being a sin. It does not. No. Um, and it was just interesting that I had this really powerful experience with a community of people um, exploring, you know, homophobia, homosexuality, mm -hmm. and really beginning to sort of understand more mm -hmm. about that instead of just literally what I was taught as a child and took in, which I think a lot of us do, right? Like oh, we yeah. just sort of take in what our, our family, our parents, our, you know, community, our church, Mm -hmm. tell us um, how to think about different things and yeah. so it was just this really beautiful experience of like mm -hmm. I said really beginning to challenge ideas that I had that I didn't even know why I felt them or thought them right, right. Um, and I think that you know continues today for some people well being raised in a Southern Baptist home myself I know exactly what it's like to be sheltered inside my mother's little bubble uh, up until puberty. So all those years going to that Southern Baptist Church hearing the same thing over and over and even hearing some even worse things from my mother, uh, uh, it didn't take very long for me to see that that was just wrong thinking. And, and actually uh, grew up in a, in a predominantly white neighborhood, went to a predominantly white elementary school, and uh, was not really exposed to much diversity as far as race goes and, and or uh, gay folks uh, until I was later in high school. And then I went into the Army and, uh, and you know, uh, we were sharing bunks with, with everybody. I mean, it was a very diverse crowd, a lot of Filipino people, a lot of black people, some from the South, some from the North. I mean, everybody had their own, you know, dialogue, their own character, dialect, you know. I mean, it was it was really interesting, and got to travel around the world with them, and you know, it made a big difference. Made a big difference. Uh, and coming back to town after being in the service, uh, being around uh, people in the arts community, people in the mu local music scene. I played in bands for years and years and years. And you, you know, you just get around different people, and you start to realize that hey, there's a there's a pretty bright world out there. <laughs> I agree with you. And Jacksonville. Is such an amazing community in that regard, right? Oh, yeah. It's really um, a diverse community, mm -hmm. um, m you know, in some pockets more inclusive than others, but <laughs> the arts community in particular is just such a treasure very and tight resource. Net. Very much so. Very, and so very, much talent. They're a tight group. They're a tight group. As a matter of fact, we're going to have Erin Kendrick in here, and uh, she's an amazing yes. artist. Her, her art is just amazing. We've had several others in here. We've got some of their stuff on the walls. Uh, got some prints here. A lot of this stuff is collected from local artists. <laughs> Lots of talent here. Yeah, yeah. They they come in and talk with us, and we just love showing their stuff off, you know. Now, uh, talking about the uh, involvement of the community in the arts, uh, and, and, and a lot of the people in the arts community are also very much involved in civic engagement. Uh, much like uh, Jack's Jams, you know, with Aaron and Shawana and so many others, so many others, too many to name. <coughs> uh, you're very much involved in civic engagement as well. I see you all over the place. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't that long ago, I would say recently, and I mean by the last few years, you ran for public office as well. That's right. I ran for the Florida State House District 15 mm -hmm. in 2018. Right, right. Along with thousands of other women who, you know. <laughs> there, were, there were a lot of women in the yes. race back then. Yes. And, and there, there have been in the last few cycles. Yes. 
but it's really increased. Lotto. Lotto. And we're seeing, I mean, it's no secret that I'm a huge supporter of women, um, local women here in Jacksonville mm -hmm. and in Florida running for public office. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be, we well, need we to have... Jean Nixon up there now. Exactly. And she's doing a phenomenal <laughs> job. Yep. Um, exactly. I've already seen a list of the bills that she's yes. sponsored, and she's yeah. only been there a short time. Yeah. Angie, uh, Tracy Davis, yeah. Senator yeah. Audrey Gibson. I mean, these are just some women. Um, Nicole Hamm, who ran for city council mm -hmm. um, this past cycle in that special election. Um, and, you know, I'm in touch with women every day. Donna Deegan, who ran for Congress, right. who are thinking about what's next for them politically, mm -hmm. um, thinking about different races in 2022 and 23. Um, <laughs> so it's exciting. it's exciting. Who are you? Who's your pick? For the next mayor of Jacksonville. Oh. <laughs> uh, we know somebody's already thrown his hat in. We, yes. we know at least one. Yes. Uh, Matt Carlucci. Yes. Uh, he, a good pick. A good pick. And, and when I get Garrett Dennis in here, I'm going to ask him about it, too. Um, <laughs> He's on his second term, so. Yes, I know. Uh, Garrett would be amazing. Yep. Um, I, I'm not going to answer that question, but I will tell you this. <laughs> I, there will be a Democratic uh, candidate for mayor. Well, good, for sure. Good, like that good. is just for sure. I'm talking to a lot of people who are considering it, thinking about mm -hmm. it. Running for office, as you know, is a big deal. Oh, it's expensive. It is expensive. Well, I ran for city council, and it, it, even even with the money that I raised, it wasn't near enough. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't enough, so I dropped out. Right. It's <laughs> it's. I mean, the, it's the money. It's the the energy that it mm -hmm. takes. Um, the time away it takes from your your job, yep. your family. Yeah, they call it um, a part-time job. It's not. No, it's, it's full-time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there will be a, dem a Democratic candidate. Good, um, good. But we need to have really thoughtful, ethical people running for office. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just Absolutely. committed to that. I think we've seen enough corruption, enough backroom deals. Like, I think people in this community are fed up with it. They are On fed both up with sides. It. They are fed up with it. Well, and that's nationwide, too. There's, you know, we're fed up from both sides of the aisle. I mean, we really are. We really are. I may be a Democrat, but there's a lot of stuff that the Democrats in Washington do that, are, to me, is just ridiculous. I agree. <laughs> It's always, you know, they're always backstabbing each other. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, as you know, I mean, it's an ugly business. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back to health care, mental health. Uh, medical marijuana. Are you an advocate, proponent? You believe that it's helpful to people with anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD? Absolutely. I'm an advocate for it. I also think it should be de decriminalized here in Jacksonville. Well, Garrett Dennis has been yes. pushing for that. Yes. Nikki Freed, our agricultural uh, commissioner, uh, she's pushing to legalize it for adult use. Uh, she's fighting against the uh, THC caps, the cap limits that they're trying to put. And that's not going to be for adults anyway. Right. It's, it's for you know, minors. But, but still, uh, she, she's been doing an incredible job. Of course, she's, she's pretty much close to the medical marijuana business anyway. Uh, so Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a proponent of it. And I was supportive of that legislation that Garrett Dennis, Council Member Dennis, tried to get through. Mm -hmm. It's a no-brainer. I mean, yeah, it's past absolutely. time to decriminalize absolutely. it in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm.